From the outside looking in, it can sometimes appear that peak performers have an elusive talent or skill that sets them apart from the rest of us. However, what usually sets peak performers apart isn't what they can do, it's what they will do. You are listening to the Trading Edges podcast, the podcast dedicated to seeking and sharing the best ideas and principles from peak performers across all domains of performance and achievement to help you discover your full trading potential. Hi, this is Houston, and welcome to another episode of Trading Edges, brought to you by thetradingedge.org. Thanks once again for taking the time to tune in. I really appreciate it. In today's episode, I interview Brendan Moynihan. Brendan's the author of numerous books, but I brought Brendan on the show to talk about one of my favorite books, and one that I often recommend to other traders, and the book's called What I Learned Losing a Million Dollars. What a great title. I actually came across this book last year when I heard Brendan on Tim Ferriss' podcast. And the funny thing is that this book is actually kind of timeless. It was actually first released in 1994, but I still find that it has very powerful application to traders and investors nowadays. So in this interview, we talk about a lot of things. But to sum it up, we talk about the life and story of Jim Paul. By the way, he's the one who actually lost over a million dollars back in the 80s which back then was a lot of money. We talk about the three mistakes that all traders and investors make, the five stages of internal loss and how that relates to trading, why Brendan advises treating trading like a game, and it's not why you think. And we finally talk about why it's a tragic mistake to tie your self-worth to your net worth. Again, thanks for listening to the podcast. I hope you enjoy this interview. Drop us a line and tell us what you th think about the show. Hi, Brendan. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. No, thank you for joining the show. So before we uh, get started today, um, I just wanted to tell everyone that Brendan is the author of numerous books, but I bought Brendan on the show because I wanted to really talk to him about one of my favorite trading books. And it's a book that I often recommend to other traders called What I Learned Losing a Million Dollars. And Brendan, I know you've probably heard it before, but what a great title. So well, what's the yeah, story the, first behind the title? <laughs> well, the, dis the disclaimer is um, I'm the, and my co-author co is actually the one who lost the money, okay? Uh, I didn't lose the money. He lost the money. And we were just trying to make a fortune off of his misfortune. Um, <laughs> no, my, my take was that there were, there were, especially in this industry, although you can go into real estate and other places as well, but there's so many books out there on how to make a million dollars in the market. Um, I just thought it was a paradox. You know, why would you write a book and sell it to other people if you know so much about how to make money in the market? Why wouldn't you just go do it yourself? And it's as old as, you know, the 1800s. I think the oldest book I found was 1871 called The Beef Bonanza, How to Get Rich on the Plains. It was about, you know, making money in livestock. I mean, it wasn't stocks, but it was livestock, you know. So, um, but what, what, what really did it for me was there was, um, I saw an interview one time with a Time Life photographer um, and they are noted, you know, in the industry for being excellent and winning awards for being great photographers. And the interview asked, what makes a time life photographer? And the, the answer was done with an example. He said, imagine a murder scene after a domestic violence uh, event where the wife had finally had enough and she kills the husband. The cops come and they're drawing chalk around the dead body and the photographers are taking pictures. And the, the time life photographer will not take the picture of the dead body take the camera and go 180 degrees and point it at the wife sitting in the corner with her head in her hands because it shows the emotion of, you know, mm. what she's done, but also she had to do it, right? But the fact yeah. of turning 180 degrees was just a different perspective. And so instead of a book on, you know, how I made a million dollars trading commodities last year, I just said, well, you know what, why don't we take Jim's story and um, marry it with sort of a clinical dry theory that I have about three mistakes that I think traders make and investors make. Um, my stuff is too dry to sell by itself. His story is too flowery <laughs> to sell by itself. But if we put them together, we might have a parable that people will identify with 
because if, if you get to know him, I mean, some of the funniest things I've ever heard, you know, he had some of the funniest stories ever, and they resonate with people. And then if you can go yeah. back and forth between his stories and get to know him a little bit, and then I kind of weave in um, some of the dry stuff, it makes it a little bit more palatable. So, Right. And that's so funny you put it that way because that's definitely what I took out of it. You know, the powerful part for me was the narrative of the story. It really keeps you going. And then you wrap up, or the second half of the book is, you know, like you said, a little more clinical, but very, very, uh, it gives you kind of that, that deeper theory that, that keeps you thinking. So the story is what draws you in, but then it's that kind of, you know, the deeper, uh, you know, kind of insights afterwards that keep you coming back to the book. That's but, what, that's and then we can refer the invoice. Yeah, in the second half of the book, we could refer back to him saying, do you remember when I did this? Well, this is an example <laughs> of, and it, it, gives, it just makes it a little bit easier to, you know, it's, it's a shuttle between, you know, theory and concrete example, theory and concrete right. example. I think it just makes it easier to, to walk away with it. So. Right. Hey, I guess the word parable is the perfect way to, to pitch it. So tell, so, so tell us a little more about, about the book. For the folks who haven't read it, it's a, it's a great book. Uh, and we'll get around to how, you know, when it was published and when it came out in the first place. But maybe, Brendan, you could just quickly tell us about uh, you know, Jim Paul's story and um, kind of how he lost a million dollars or maybe even a little yeah. more than that. <laughs> well, the, the event took place in 1983. Um, he was a floor trader in Chicago at the Merck. He was a lumber trader. And you know, he had grown up, and we tell it in the, in, in the story of the book, um, Everything he touched turned to gold. I mean, he was born dirt poor in Ellesmere, Kentucky, and, you know, was a caddy and, you know, got a taste of the good life and decided he wanted to do that. Um, he went to, <clears throat> went to college instead of waiting to be, you know, asked to pledge you a, a, a fraternity. He just walked in one day and said, we just, I just want to be here. It's like, and they took him. So, like, everything, he, he had a golden touch. Like, everything he did worked for him. And um, we got into the markets, and things worked for him. And he was a lumber trader, but got very excited with a friend of his in a, a, a soybean oil trade, and wound up with a limit position um, at the Board of Trade in, in, in oil, oil, uh, soybean oil spreads. I think, there was, I think he had 540 of them on. The reason he had a limit on is because he went over the limit, and the exchange called him and slapped him. So he had to you know, back the position off. But... Um, in 75 days, starting at the beginning of September, um, he lost 1.6 of the $1.2 million that he had in 75 wow. days. So a little quick yeah. math leaves him down $400,000. And um, like I say, that was 1983. I didn't meet Jim until 1989. I worked for him for about a year. And on the last day of my employment with him, we went to lunch. It was an amicable I – was, I was being – uh, I was recruited and I was leaving town and um, it was all amicable. So he and I went to lunch and he told me a little bit about the story only then. And uh, mm. he, said, somebody said I should, he said, somebody said I should write a book about this. I said, you know what? I can write that book. <laughs> so, you know, great. You waited until I left town to tell you, to tell me, right? So, <laughs> so, so uh, I had him, take, uh, he was supposed to tape record the story and tell somebody who had never heard it before so that he would be very animated. He was supposed to tape record yeah. and send it to me. Well, about six months goes by, and he still hadn't done it, and he called me, and he mailed me plane tickets and said, you have to do it. You come up here and record it. So <laughs> I went to his house for like two or three days, and I took about 18 hours worth of tape down, and um, then I took it back, and I, mean, I was a bond trader. I didn't, I didn't know how to type, um, but I started to learn. Uh, it took about three years for me to go transcribe his stuff and then get it in some order, come up with the ideas of my own. And I had a full-time job and you know, two kids, so it wasn't like you know, this was the only thing I was doing. And then I had to kind of flesh out my, my ideas a little bit more. And, and I'd never written a book before, so I didn't really know what I was doing. But um, that's kind of the, you know, the, the nutshell of the, back, of the backstory to kind of get it going. Well, what a great story. So before we get much deeper, why don't you tell, tell us a little bit about your background. So it sounds like before you, you met, uh, before you started writing the book, you were, you were a trader, and then you became, became an author shortly thereafter. But uh, yeah, tell us uh, a little bit more about your story. How did you get started with uh, trading and just your background? Yeah, well, I, uh, in college, I think I knew I wanted to do it. I knew I wanted to trade, and I wanted to trade bonds. Oh. And I came out of college, and I did get a job in Nashville uh, working on a cash bond desk for about a year. But I also knew that, <clears throat> you know, I really needed to be in Chicago or New York, at least for a little while early in the career. So... Um, I was 
very interested in futures, and so I went to Chicago, and um, I worked up there as a, as a research analyst for a couple of years, and then uh, went out on my own and started trading on my own, and uh, did that for a while. Um, I picked up a gig with Jim, doing some, uh, being an analyst for them in foreign exchange, and that's how I got to know him. And then, <clears throat> like I say, the, the firm that I'd worked for um, you know, in Nashville recruited me back, and that's when I left and had the lunch with him, and he told me about the, the story and everything. And so I went back down there, and I traded bonds for about five years, and then I went across the street and traded currencies for about two and a half. And September 17, 1997, I quit and went home and wanted to be around to help raise my two boys, by then five and eight. And I had about four or five research clients that, um, that I wrote research for um, in different fields, um, stocks, bonds, currencies, commodities. And I just worked out of my house for about 15 years and um, you know, working uh, and started to be around while they were growing up. Um, yeah, that's a great and, lifestyle. That's great. Yeah, and then one of the, clients, I, one of the clients was Bloomberg. Um, so I, you know, I, I consulted for Bloomberg News for a long time, and uh, I'm still a consultant there uh, now. I mean, that's, that's 15 years. I started that in March of 2000. So, um, yeah, so that's so, – so, I mean, I, I – the only thing that qualified me to write the book in the first place was that I had been in the markets and had, you know, my own series of losses. And when I, wrote, mm. when I finished the book and gave it a gym and he read it um, – he was very full of himself, you know, in, just in general. But he said, <laughs> he goes, yeah, I know my story part, but how do you know about all this awesome stuff? I'm like, you know, you're so vain. You're so vain. You think you're the only person in the world who's lost money trading, okay? But I may not lo- I may not have lost a million dollars in 75 days. But you know what? It doesn't matter. If I lose five grand or 10 grand or 15 grand in a trade, it's the same process. You just want right. to be monumental about it, right? I mean, yeah. I did it in small proportions. You did it in biblical proportions. But it's the same thing. <laughs> And it sounds like Jim Paul was a larger-than-life character. Is that a fair characterization? He or? Yeah, he was. He was. He was. Uh, Big booming voice because he was in the lumber pit, so he was loud. His voice sounded like gravel in the bottom of an empty coffee can. It was. <laughs> and he'd walk into it. We ran out of batteries. While we were doing, the, the batteries, you know, wore out in the, in the recorder. So we jumped in the car and drove around the corner or whatever to a place. We walk in, you know, we're looking for batteries. And I'm thinking, okay, I'll go find the aisle. No, he just walks in and says, hello, oh. calling for... It's in their batteries, okay? They're on the shelf somewhere. He just, it was, he, was, he, was, he was probably 6'2". Um, he wasn't, he wasn't a, not a heavy build, but just, just I mean, he, with that and the voice and, um, you know, you, as you, you, well, you've read the book, so you know some of the stories where you're just absolutely yeah. outrageous. I mean, you know, <laughs> yeah. he's in, well, and he's in South Korea. He's 23 years old. He has the purple key to release the nuclear weapon onto the plane, you know, to take off. And he's like, what am I doing? Two years ago, I was burning deck chairs in the bonfire on the beach down in Daytona, Florida. You know, it's like, I have no business <laughs> with this key. But they entrusted uh, him with him. So, yeah, he was, he was nuts. He was nuts. I think the next, I think the next step is, is to have a movie made. I think that just makes sense. <laughs> yeah, I've got somebody in mind for that, though, actually. I mean, I own the rights to the whole thing. <laughs> uh, no, yeah, I do. I do. Um, that's I've great. Got a son in, I've got a son in Los Angeles, and um, so – just got out of college, and that's the industry he wants to be in. So we might wind up doing that. Yeah, that'd be great. I'd definitely buy tickets for that. <laughs> so let's just quickly shift gears for a second. So, you know, just talking about the book again, you know, as I was telling Brendan before the call, I came across your book uh, when I heard you on Tim Ferriss' podcast last year. And then I received your book as part of uh, Tim Ferriss' quarterly box. And my understanding is that your, this book was first published back in 1994. And it yes. just kind of blows my mind that, that you know, we're still talking about it today. And it just kind of speaks to the timelessness of the subject matter and, and of, of, of your writing. So, so how, how does it feel to still be talking about, you know, this, this title, this book? So you must have, you know, have talked about this <laughs> dozens of times. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I mean, the, the, the Tim Ferriss thing um, uh, did kind of, you know, get a little bit more attention uh, to people. But what there was a step before that that enabled him to even find out about it because – we self-published the book um, October 4th, 1994, and um, you know, nobody was self-publishing books back then. We did it because we didn't like the economics of the book industry, but we sold it out of a post office box in Nashville, Tennessee, box 198038. And we were lucky enough to get a byline on the cover of Forbes magazine right above Jack Welch's head that says, Biggest Mistakes Investors Make, Are You Guilty? Mark Holbert, who does the mutual fund column there, <clears throat> did a full article on it. 
And, you know, at the time it was like call 1-800-BUY-BOOK. And we had, you know, a book distributor that they could buy books that way or they could mail to the P.O. box. And that was how we got the book out. There was no, I mean, despite what Al Gore says, there was an Internet then, but there was no World Wide <laughs> Web. Um, right. So, so the only, I mean, it was a, it was a very kind of crude way of, of, of selling the book. But that, I mean, we, we were the only source, okay? I mean, we owned the book and it was not in bookstores, okay? Yeah. So um, I know a number of years went by and, um, you know, we, 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 we printed a number of copies and got them all sold out. And then, and then it just kind of died down and got quiet. And the book was basically out of print. But when Google announced in the early 2000s that they were going to start scanning out of print books, um, I was outraged, but it was like, you know, it took me three years to write this, and mm. I'm not going to just let my work be scanned Give it away for free. I'm sorry. Yeah. So I was already leaning that way and kind of getting things together when um, Nassim Taleb's book, The Black Swan, came out. And in, in that book, he gives it a nice plug, and he's, he's not known for – for handing out compliments. I've, I've, Not I've, at all. I've, I've yeah. Fine. yeah. But he said, he said, the best finance book I've read is what I learned was a million dollars. And <laughs> that kind of gave it a jolt as well. So I repub- that was April 2007. I republished the book then. And, you know, it was up on Amazon. And, you know, then it, we were on Amazon before, but the book did basically go out of print. And there, there's a story there as well, which I can explain if you're interested. But there was a, a window where it was not in print, and then, you know, used copies were going on Amazon for like two or $300 or something. And I'm like, you know, I got a couple here. Do you want one here? Um, <laughs> so, 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 you know, it, 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 it went back out on, in 2007, <clears throat> but then along 2000, I was, you know, I was just selling them, you know, off, off of Amazon and paying my kids to fulfill the orders, and, you know, they got some money, and they learned a little bit about customer service and, you know, selling and whatever, whatever. Um, yeah. But then Columbia University Press uh, got a hold of it in 2011 and bought the rights, and then they republished it with a new cover. And because they can get into bookstores, then right. it found a bit more attention. And then Tim Ferriss found out about it, and, and that's how you found out about it. So it's really only in the last two or three years. Um, in terms of it still being talked about, there are two things. One, yeah, it, it, they are, I do believe they are timeless lessons. We've been making these – traders and investors have been making these mistakes, these three mistakes, I think, you know, time immemorial. And I don't think it's going to change going forward because it's all based on human nature. In terms of how does it feel that, you know, well, I, I, you know, we were talking before things got started. Somebody asked, uh, Jim and I were talking about this years ago, and he said, you know, um, do you remember there was an interview where somebody was interviewing Glenn Campbell, the country music western star. He said, you know, what does it feel like to be discovered? And he said, yeah, I was discovered after 15 years of playing the dirty hockey <laughs> talks out in the southwest. Well, okay, yeah. so Columbia University Press, 19 years after I self-published the book, they, they find, they discover it, republish it, and then like the next year it wins this book award, which, you know, and I don't know that it was necessarily a big book award, but it won the award. It's got the little gold medal and, you know, the little certificate and blah, blah, blah. And it's yeah. like, you know, it took 19 years. It's a good thing I wasn't <laughs> trying to live as an author. I mean. Yeah. <laughs> and did, did, you, did you set out to, like, to try to create something timeless? Because, you know, it's like many of those books that, that, you know, talk about getting rich quick, they're kind of a flash in the pan, right? So those, yeah. they, uh, well, they, they, they burn I mean, quickly and they, then they burn out. <laughs> but I just, I mean, because, because this is the flip side, it's like, yeah. never mind about making money. It's like, what do you yeah. do wrong? Well, we're human. We're always going to make mistakes. And there's a whole new crop of us coming along, you know, every couple of years. And it's like, yeah. they're going to make them too. So I didn't sit down and say, I want my book to go down in, you know, the annals of, 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 of trading book history. It was just... Yeah. It was in my head. Um, I had to get it out, and Jim's story seemed to be the vehicle to make that work. I had something to say. Um, the other books have basically been, yeah, I have something to say about this, and a book seems to be a way to do that. So I don't, I don't necessarily sit down. I mean, again, this is not what I do for a living, right? I mean, I don't play yeah. tennis. I don't play golf. So I don't have a TV, so this is what I do instead. Yeah. But what a ba- great backstory. So, so let's, let's talk about the book. So the book is just dealt with, like, quotables and great ideas. And you've already talked about the big one. So the three mistakes that investors make, you teased that already. So what are those three mistakes? I'm not going to tell anybody. They have to go buy the book. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, what happened was, I mean, I, didn't, I, I do think, I believe that, that I identified the three things that I had done wrong, you know, repeatedly. And I talked to other traders, and, you know, I just kind of danced around it. I didn't say, hey, I'm doing research for a book, you know. But I, I, I kind of heard the same, the same thing. 
So it was sometime into writing the book that I ran across, um, or I don't know what prompted me to do it, but I said, you know, basically this is a light treatise on the, treatise on the psychology of trading. So I looked at the definition of psychology in the dictionary, and it says, it is a study of the mental processes, behavioral characteristics, and emotions of an individual or a group. I'm like, all right, well, those are the three things that I've been writing about. So chapter six is about the mental processes. <laughs> chapter seven is about the behavioral characteristics. I mean, I'd already written it. I just kind of yeah. took the, the definition and just unpacked it and just labeled the chapters that way because that's exactly what it is. So basically mm-hmm. the, the mental processes <clears throat> um, are internalizing what should be an external loss. Um, when you lose your keys, you know, you don't go into a deep funk, right? <laughs> right. It's, it's an external loss. You find them, right? <clears throat> um, an, an internal loss is the loss of a... <clears throat> a a loved one, a parent, an uncle, a grandmother dies or whatever. <clears throat> These are internal losses. And in that, people go through five stages of internal loss, which I've labeled it, I've labeled it internal loss. The five stages of loss come from a book um, called On Death and Dying by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, in which she interviewed 200 patients who were terminally ill to find out is there a common thread. And this is where you may have seen in other writings or whatever, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, yes. acceptance, right? So the exact same thing happens when you suffer an internal loss, whether it's you getting ready to lose your life or you lose a, a, a loved one to death, like denial, then anger, then bargaining, then depression, and then you finally accept it. The same thing in the market, right? You're losing money. Denial. Really? You see the opening quote in the market. Really? I was in Jordan one time in July 23rd, 1988. The beans opened down a dollar nine and a half. I'm like, is this a bad quote? Is there something wrong here? I mean, <laughs> right. it's just, right. it was like, there's something, 1094, which is 109 and a half in, in beans. I'm just like, there's something wrong here, right? No, no. It yeah, rained it's belief, right? That was, right. Yeah. So denial and then anger. You get mad at the market. You cuss at it. You throw your phone, whatever. Depressed. Yeah. So it's the same process. And it's, what I'm saying is, when you lose money in the market, it's an external loss. But if you start observing yourself that you're going through denial and then anger and then bar- you've internalized what should be an external loss, okay? Mm-hmm. So that's, that's one of the main, that's one of the things kind of outlined there in terms of what are the mental processes of somebody who's lo- who, who is a quote-unquote loser or, or in jeopardy of really losing money because of psychological reasons, not because of the technical system that you're using to, right. to try to make money. Right. So the behavioral characteristics. In here, I think that people confuse the, the, the difference between <clears throat> um, inherent risk and created risk. So, so inherent risk is just the risk of everyday life. You walk down the street, you get hit by a car, you know, you get a disease, you die, whatever. Created risk is speculative risk. All, you know, all the stuff could go on, every game <clears throat> could be played, every roulette wheel spun. No money has to change hands. There has to be no loss unless people go ahead and decide to wager, okay? In this chapter, I go through and say there are five types of participants in the market. You have investors, traders, speculators, bettors, and gamblers, and investors are parting with their capital with the expectation of return in the form of interest, dividends, or rent. That's according to Adam Smith. All of those things are paid on a periodic basis. So it's either monthly or quarterly or semi-annually, whatever, right? So you plan on being parted with your capital for an extended period of time, so you have a long time for us. Uh, traders, to me, are... Um, just market makers, which are largely gone these mm-hmm. days. But, you know, buying the bid, sell the offer, go home flat. They're just trying to, to extract the bid asset spread. Speculators yep. are looking for the difference in price change. They don't intend to commit their capital long enough to get interest, dividends, or rent, right? They're, they're flipping it, right? <clears throat> Betters are interested in being right. Mm-hmm. You and I can have, I mean, what, what used to be called, I don't know if it's politically correct or not to say anymore, you and I can have a gentleman's bet where no money changes yep. hands, right? But whoever's right gets bragging rights, okay? Or you have a pinky bet, right? You're, it's just, no money yeah. changes hands. You just want to be right. Just and then they're gamblers. Ego. Right, yeah. exactly. And then they're gamblers, which is, I admit, you know, it's, it is a disease. Um, I'm not qualified to, you know, address it or whatever. I know there's a Gamblers Anonymous. I went to a couple of meetings when I was doing research for the book to find out, you know, what's going on, what is this all about. But what, I, what happened, I think, is that People confuse that. You know, they, they don't realize that there are those five, and that very often people are winding up in that, in that better's camp, okay? Um, mm. For a lot of people, an investment is a trade that didn't work out. 
I'm going to buy this. It's expecting it to go up. It doesn't work. You're like, oh, that's long term. I'm going to hold on to that. That's just, you know. <laughs> right. And then, but a lot of times people are more interested in being right, um, you know, than making money. So I go through, you know, those, the, 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 the characteristics, of both the, the behavioral characteristics of the different types of activities, as yeah. well as um, the characteristics that take place in, um, uh, in, in, in casinos where, with games of chance, the game ends, okay? Right. So in gambling games, the game ends. You don't have to do anything. It stops, and there, there's no question who won, who lost, okay? <clears throat> With the markets, they're always open. You know, on the weekends, they're open because the market will gap down, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, people are going to make decisions based on the news over the weekend, and so the market's going to gap down on Monday, and, you know, life is what it is. So the problem is that Gambling, you know, betting is fine in games of chance gambling environments, you know, whether you're playing poker, you know, with friends or whether you're actually in Las Vegas or doing whatever. I'm not advocating it. I've never done it in my life, but I mean, I don't understand why people do it. But um, betting is fine in that environment because it will end by itself. But if right. you're betting, if you're trying to be right in the market, which never closes, It'll give you more excitement than you can imagine because you can go through, now I'm going to tie in that previous chapter, you can go through denial, anger, bargaining, and then have the market rally for you. And you're like, okay, good, okay. Now it's turned back up. Then it rolls over. And you go denial, anger, bargaining again to a new lower low, right? Yes. So you can loop back through denial, anger, bargaining, depression, maybe three or four times before you ever get to acceptance. Or, you know, it wow. shouldn't have happened in the first place, but because yeah. it never ends by itself, it's always open, and you're betting and you're trying to be right on something that doesn't end by itself, you know, you're, you're leaving yourself open to those two chapters working with each other to create a real problem for yourself. <clears throat> so it's like a real groundhog day that just, keeps, that just keeps turning over and over again until you yeah. I think they should get release, dumped out. <laughs> I think they should release um, Groundhog Two Day, like Groundhog Day too, like a, a, a sequel, <laughs> yeah. and just play the first one over again. <laughs> that would be a clever spin. I, I like that. <laughs> they don't have to spend any money. <laughs> they get a whole new generation of people watching it, too. <laughs> That's right. Did you see the first one? No, I saw the second one. <laughs> it's kind of like what Disney does every uh, few years with their, with their big titles, like Bambi comes out every 25 years or whatnot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so back to the mistake. So number one is internalizing an external loss. Number two is kind of confusing what type of participant so you are. Types of risk activities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then, yeah. and then the, the emotions. So the deal with emotions is now. Uh, um, so if you were if you were to um, ask most people, <clears throat> what are the the two driving emotions in the market? They will typically say fear and greed. Okay. Right. Well, I I I, I disagree with that. Um, I, I, first of all, I, I'll give you the, the reason in a second. First of all, I think emotions, emo, emotions are neither good nor bad. They just are, okay? Mm -hmm. They happen, right? Your dog yeah. dies, I guess you feel sad, right? I mean, th these, these things just happen. You feel happy, you feel sad, you feel whatever. It is what it is. Decision-making based on emotions, that's, that I can put a value judgment on and say that's not good. Experiencing emotions is fine. It's decision-making under that, that rubric that, that creates the problem. Mm -hmm. So... Um, I think that rather than, 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 than trying to like deal with, you know, all, there, there are lots of books out there on, you know, oh, you're this way because your mother didn't kiss you goodnight when you were six years old. I can't do any of that, okay? I'm not qualified to do that. I majored in finance. It's not really what I did. But what I can say is that if, that if you really look at it, it's not fear and greed that are the driving emotions in the market. It's, it's, it's hope and fear. Our natural responses to the uncertainty of the future, which – Mm -hmm. is the markets and is the topic of the next book that I'm, that I'm currently researching and working on right now, our natural responses to that are hope and fear. We hope things are going to turn out well and we fear they won't. The right. paradox is this. We experience both of those simultaneously and whichever one is dominant dictates what your action is going to be. So, for example, if you're long and the market's going up, you hope it's going to keep going and you fear it won't. If fear and right. greed, if, if fear and greed were really the driving emotions, greed means wanting 
excessive amounts of something. So yeah. if you're along the market and it's going up and it turns around and starts going down, if you were greedy, you would get out, get short, and get more product, make, make more money. So it's not, it's not greed. Otherwise, you'd do that. It's hope and fear. So if you're along and the yeah, market's yeah. going up, you hope it's going to keep going, and you fear it won't. Whichever one is dominant will dictate whether you stay in or get out. Right. So let's say that you're yeah. fearful it's not going to keep going, and you get out. Now you know what you feel? You hope it's going to keep going down to make you look right, and you fear right. it's going to go back up. Okay, that's just one variation. Now you can imagine flipping around and being short, same thing, or not being in the market, watching it go up, hoping it will pull back, fearing it won't. Whichever one dominates will dictate what you do. It, we, it is a constant tussle back and forth between those two emotions that dictates what we do. And making decisions based on that is what I'm saying is about you, you can experience emotions. It is what it is, right? But yeah. making decisions based on that is the, is the problem. Yeah, it's that real tug of war between hope and fear. So like that, that, that is the last, last example. If you're trying to get it, get filled on a pullback, you get filled and now you're hoping it doesn't go much further down as you've gone filled already. Or, you're going now wrong. you're filled. Now you hope it starts going up, but you're afraid it won't. You're <laughs> like, oh, oh no. there we go. <laughs> it's like, yeah. yeah. And, it's, and you turn on a dime. You turn on a dime. You know, it's like, yeah. it's like being manic depressive, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so you know, in the book you talk about, so one way that you, you talk about dealing with some of these emotions, and I think you call it emotionalism in your trading, is, well, I think a couple ways. You, 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 several layers here, but number one, you, you talk about treating trading like a game. So why do you say that? Well, I mean, I'm saying if you're, you, need, you need to have some predefined end point to the position. Right. I'm not going to prescribe what methodology you should use. There are hundreds of methodologies out there. I just think that regardless of what methodology you use, you need sort of this backdrop so that no, no, not all methodologies are going to work at the same time. If yours, yours might be working and mine might be losing, my, mine might not be working, but I need to at least know about these three mistakes so I get myself out of it, okay? Right. To the extent of treating it like a game, I only mean there needs to be some end point. And you do that by scripting things out ahead of time. What are the circumstances that are going to get me in, and what are the circumstances or conditions or price, whatever it is based on my methodology to get me out? And if yeah. there's a problem with that, then I address that, but not while I have a market position on. If my system isn't right. working, my methodology isn't working, whatever, do the analysis when you're not in the market. Don't do it when you're in there because you will succumb to this hope fear paradox, and then you'll subject yourself to denial, anger, bargaining, depression. And it's, it's just insane. <clears throat> so yeah. to the extent that That's, I'm saying yeah. it like a game, yeah, to the extent that I'm treating it like a game, I'm just saying you need to know what the boundaries and the endpoints are. It has to have some set of prescribed ahead of time circumstances to bring resolution to the position. Yeah, well said. So it's kind of putting that structure on top of this continuous process that never really ends. So you're exactly. trying to basically turn it into a discrete process that, that you can better right. manage versus just having it run and run on forever. Exactly. Uh, and so then how does that layer then into having a trade plan? Is that exactly what we're talking about? Is that trade plan? Trade plan yeah, becomes yeah, exactly. I'm just saying, you know, just have it, yeah, have it, having it written out ahead of time, objectifying it, getting it out of your head and putting it down on paper. Um, yeah. I am a big, I'm a big proponent of, and this kind of comes from the, the title of the book. Instead of, you know, putting a position on and then outlining, or let's just say you're putting in the stop. Instead of getting in the market and then putting in a stop loss order, you know, I mean, this might sound just like a, a little bit, you know, uh, you know, quirky, but like, put your stop in first. <laughs> yeah. and, and then get in the market. It's like, okay, at this level, I've, you know, I've either, I don't have enough money to go beyond that, or I think that enough technical damage has been done, or it violates what, you know, rules three, four, and seven of my, you know, my system or whatever. It ha have it down. And, and I think writing it out, I mean, I think literally, if you get it, if you objectify it, 
you're a lot more likely to follow your own ideas if you have written it out ahead of time and put it out on paper. Yeah. And just don't deviate from it while the position's there. If you get knocked out, you get knocked out four times in a row. If there's something wrong with your system, figure it out when you're not in the market. But don't, don't try to move or change things in there because then the psychology takes over and you just make it worse. Right. Yeah. So the risk management just becomes, like you said there, it's worry about the risk ahead of, ahead of your, your order is kind of what your, what your take is. Is, you know, yeah, like don't tell me the words, but certainly, yeah. Yeah, don't tell me the good news. I know you're going to tell me the good news. Tell me the bad <laughs> news first, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. Or, you know, or, or, and one of the examples I give in the book is like people say, okay, this trade has a three to, you know, a three to one risk reward ratio. I'm like, no, no it doesn't. I'm making that up. It doesn't say. <laughs> there's, there, there's nothing in the odds of the probability that says that so what you're saying is you're willing to risk one in order in order to make what you think might be three. But right. there, there, there's, there's no probability that you can attach to that and say, oh, it's a, you know, it's a three to one reward to risk ratio. That's, that's, that's yeah. nonsense, but we, but we kid ourselves into that, right? I mean, yeah. it's, one of the, it's one of the weird ways that we distort looking at, at, at risk. It's like, and this one's in the book as well, <clears throat> the odds of you know, winning a lottery might be one in a million, okay? The odds of getting struck by lightning might be one in a million. You think you're going to win the lottery, but you don't think you're going to get struck by lightning. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, so, you know, it's, it's just some of the ways that we, that we, that we kid ourselves. And this is what I'm saying. It's, it's a psychology. And that's why, to me, that's why it's timeless, right? It's like, yeah. you know, people that I talk to read the book, but then they, then they read the book again later in the year or they, read, they visit especially like the second half where the lessons are kind of there. It's like, you mm-hmm. know, a couple times a year, they'll just kind of go back and, and buzz through that as a refresher because we're all just subject to it. It's just what goes on between our ears, you know. Um, it's, it's, not, it's, it's not like we become, you know, evolved, psychologically mature entities. We, we tend to make the same kind of mistakes over and over again, almost no matter how old we are. We just have to, that's yeah. why I don't think it's going to go away. Now, it's, 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 I don't know. It's, it's never going to be a big rampant bestseller. It doesn't matter. But for the people who have kind of gotten a hold of it, it's like, yeah, I see, I, I see the benefits of this. And it kind of applies to, to just about everybody. I absolutely agree. And I definitely, I'm definitely one of those uh, people who, who, who's gone back to the book numerous times. I'm just looking at my copy right now. It's kind of all dog-eared and underlined. But I find myself revisiting this book probably at least once a quarter. I'll do something. And, you know, you have a, you know, the story of Jim Paul is, you know, I guess, is a great story around, you know, how the self-attribution bias kind of took over and he kind of attributed a lot of his success to his own, his, his own doing and yeah. <laughs> you know, that kind of just kind of magnified things. And I think most traders fall into that trap, especially male traders. <laughs> I yeah, no, I agree. Testosterone yeah. or <laughs> yep. something, I don't know. No, it is. It is. It is. It is true. Uh, and so I find myself, yeah, you know, I'll have a hot streak and, and, you know, I think I'm, you know, king of the world. <laughs> and then not soon after, of course, you know, Mr. Market will, will slap me pretty hard. So yep, that's when that's I have right. to revisit the book and <laughs> read the chapters again. <laughs> yeah. So another interesting thing is just around, you know, so going back to the trade plan for a second. So how, how do you, you know, the funny thing is I've you know, talked about this before on this podcast, but um, – I'm always surprised, number one, a lot, a lot of traders, even folks who've been trading for a while, they don't have a really defined trade plan. And then the second part that a lot of traders struggle with is just being compliant around that trade plan. So they may have something written down, but they really struggle around, you know, maintaining compliance. So how do you, you know, what do you advise yeah. people who are like, yeah, I got it pretty black and white, but I just can't follow it. Things happen during yeah. the session and you know, I just go, I go nuts. Yeah, I think, well, I think a lot of it is, and this isn't something that I really go into in the, in the book because it's, it's, again, it's not, this is, it's, it's, it's not really one of the mistakes. It's, it's mm. a good point to try to figure out how do you implement what, what I've laid out and, and, and hope to be useful um, advice. 
And the word really just, it really just comes down to discipline. And the question is, you know, are you self-disciplined or do you need inflicted discipline? Some people are very self-disciplined. They can sit down. Right. Um, they, can, they can work in a room by themselves for, you know, 15 years and, 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 and get stuff done. Other people have to be, in an, you know, have to be around other people. If that's the case, um, you know, I would say two things. One, whatever your whatever normal routine chores it is that you're supposed to be doing around the house, you know, it's like one way to build discipline is to like do it, okay? Um, anybody who exercises regularly, if you're not, and you start, I mean, anything you can do to, to, to demonstrate that discipline, even just outside the trading side, you know, whether you're exercising four times a week or every day or whatever it is, I mean, take out the garbage every time you're supposed to, wash the car every week or whatever it is, anything to kind of establish some, some sense of discipline there. If you really don't have that self-discipline and you need somebody else involved, then you write out the trade plan with, um, you know, an objective third party, uh, a broker, um, or, you know, a, a, a trading partner, and, you yep. know, you swap plans. And it's like, look, mm. I can get myself into a position. I, I'm just yeah. horrible at getting myself out, you know, because I'll change yeah. the stop when it starts coming my way. Well, you know, turn, the tr- turn it over to somebody else. And that's, there's actually an example of that in the, in, in the book. Jim said one of the best right. trades that he ever made, he got short gold at like 300 on its way up to, you know, 800. It's because he gave the the buy stop to someone else, so yeah. that he wasn't, you know, left to, to to try to manage that thing. And what it does a little bit is, you know, left to your own devices. You know, you might change the stop or get stopped out and put it back on. But if, one thing we don't like to look foolish. Okay, you right. might be a little bit less inclined to do some stupid things if you do turn the the execution of the especially the, the law side, over to someone else yes. to make sure it's implemented, okay? Um, and that's about as far as I can go. Like I said, it's not something I really delve into in the book, but just thinking about it yeah. now when you're asking me, that's, it's discipline and self-discipline. And if you don't have a lot of self-discipline, then you need a trusted, you know, other party um, to assist in the, uh, the implementation. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. And maybe, you know, with technology the way it is, is nowadays, maybe folks are really struggling Maybe they can automate some of those strategies and just kind of take, like you said, the execution out of their hands so they don't rationalize <laughs> their, their, yeah. stop, their stop management. Yeah. 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 That's, a great, that's a great piece of advice. And, you know, that kind of ties into as well as, you know, the, the inability to make, I guess, I guess stay compliant with your trade plan. It's also kind of linked to kind of the random reward structure of, of the markets, right? So sometimes yeah. you feel like you can break the rules because you get rewarded and, you know, it was like, hey, I've been, I did the right thing by not following my rules 100% of the time. But that ultimately comes back to bite you. <laughs> it does, board, because right? that, that schedule, that random reward schedule, for anybody who's you know, looked at um, you know, behavioral psychology, and if you want to get an activity to increase its frequency, yeah. whether it's an animal looking for food or you know, whatever it is, Give it a random reward schedule, and right. um, you know to the extent that random applies to prices moving in the markets. Um, you know it's a typical random walk down Wall Street, random price moving. To the extent to the extent that that's all accepted or whatever, yeah, I mean the market will give you a random a random <laughs> reward schedule. And like yeah. you said, if sometimes you break the rules, and you know it's, that's one of the examples Jim gives in the book. You know it's like you know. Is it okay to break the rules or is it not okay to break the rules? It's like, you know, well, when you're playing poker, it's one thing. I mean, the Cincinnati kid, that's one thing. But if you're in the market, uh, you know, you're leaving yourself open to, again, these three mistakes yeah. feed on each other. They don't, it, it's not like, it's, I just, I mean, I wrote it and then I just decided to sequence six, seven, and eight in the order in which that definition flows. That doesn't mean that's necessarily the order. I mean, you can right. start doing hope and fear first and then start confusing the different types of perspective and then go into the it, so it, it can start in any part of the definition but they feed right. on each other it's not they're not compartmentalized they can feed on each other yeah yeah so the yeah the, some of the parts are, are bigger than the individual parts yeah that makes a lot of sense and so neat that the random reward structure schedule is just such a powerful idea because you know like you said they've done the experience in, with rats and they you know you see people how they how they play the slot machines in Vegas, and it's the same way with the markets. Uh, 
you know, oftentimes, you know, we've heard that saying, it's like, oh, rules are meant to be broken. <laughs> but uh, yeah. buyer beware, or, or I guess trader beware when you start doing, doing yep. that. Uh, you might get the reward, you know, seven out of ten times, but those three times will really <laughs> set you back a long, yep. long way. Yeah. So that that takes us, you know, to the next to the next thing that I love that I talked to you about is is that that really powerful idea around tying your self worth to 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 do, to your net worth or your wins and losses, right? So how yeah. we can so easily tie our, our self image to to our our, our current trading uh, trading account size or you know yeah. our wins and losses. Well, I, I, yeah, and I think that that's, I mean, that, what that's in, in Chapter 6 is connected to how does an external loss become an internal loss? What right. happens that converts a loss of money into denial, anger, bargaining, blah, blah, blah. And I think that a lot of it stems from the conditioning we get in school. We, quote, unquote, lose points for wrong answers, you don't get a test and, mm. and have the teacher put in. The teacher doesn't say plus three on this, plus two on that, plus nine. On, no, everything is a subtraction. You yeah. you get the blank test and it's worth a hundred, right? <laughs> yeah. You turn it the guy and, and they ain't no answers yet, right? You turn it back in, and and the teacher's up there, you know, knocking points off. Okay, so we lose points for wrong answers. So if we lose money, we think we must be wrong, and none of us wants to be wrong. We right. want to be right, and so very often we are betters in the market in a continuous process rather than a discrete event, games where it's okay to do that, <clears throat> and this gets us into trouble. So we don't we we don't want to be wrong, right? Yeah, and. It, it, is, it is a confusion between self-worth and net worth. Um, more, people are very often more interested in the gold stars of being right than the, the gold money of actually making money you know, in, 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 in trading. So, yeah, I do think yeah. people can confuse those two. And, to the, and you know, Jim did it. Jim did it on the upside first, right? It's like his yeah. self-worth was all tied around the $1.2 million, $1 million trading account. <clears throat> then he promptly went out and lost more than that. <laughs> like what? <I> mean, right. <laughs> so you know, at the end of the day, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, it was just like he was worth minus four hundred. You know, it's like yeah. So <laughs> and so, how do you disconnect that? So, how do, is do you have any ideas around how do you disconnect that? Because it seems like it's well, so tied together. I, what, what, I know, but what I hope what I hope is happening is if I'm unpacking it. And putting it yeah. in front of people that think about it that way. I mean, I yeah. hadn't read about it, you know, presented that way before. Um, yeah. And again, I mean, it's, it's, it's almost like it's the expose, right? It's like I'm just saying these are some really important things to think about and some things to monitor in your own behavior and thinking to see mm. if you're succumbing to these psychological mistakes, that you need to do something right. to step back so that, when you lose money, you lose it because of your methodology, not because of your stupidity. You want right. to try to bulletproof to the extent you can your methodology yeah. without tinkering it with your head. So to right. find out if you're about to be doing that, these are some things to observe in yourself in doing that, right? Um, if you yeah. find yourself bragging about the size of the trading account, Ding, 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 ding. You know, it's like, hello. <laughs> <You're>, <laughs> yeah. Or tell yeah. people how much money you made in the day. It's none of their business. Uh, and they may not even have asked you, right? It's like. <laughs> exactly. You're volunteering the information, right? <laughs> Hi, my name is Brendan, and I made $5,000 trading commodities yesterday. It's like, they, don't, they don't care, okay? I mean, unless you're trying to impress them. In which case, yeah. you need to be doing it some other way, you know? I mean. It just makes sense. Like I think, it just I think you know as, as you're saying that, it's like why not just have like a little checklist of all the things that you know you you yeah, should be doing. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, free play. Yeah. yeah. No, it's not a bad idea. And and having that yeah. again, just but writing it down and then just like okay, I mean you could even I mean theoretically we're just talking about it right now, right? You make your check checklist. You use it each day. And then it's like okay, here's what I'm supposed to do. Here's what I'm not supposed to do. And then like yeah, okay. Draw a line to the ones that you've, or, you know, I don't know, circle the ones that you failed on. It's like, okay, how? It's, it's a discipline. It's like, am I sticking to it? Am I, and if that's a, yeah. that's a method for doing it, you know, print, you know, type it up on a computer, print out 50, 50 copies of it, or, you know, however long you have the position on it or whatever. It's just like, all right, 
did I do this? Did I do this? Did I do this? And if you find yourself, you know, calling up your friends and saying, hey, I'm making a lot of money today, it's like, okay, you have to stop doing that, okay? <laughs> Absolutely. Because now you're and I'm guilty as charged. You know, yeah. I'm, I'm guilty as charged. I was just saying that, uh, I, was, I was reflecting that my wife knows that I'm training well. <laughs> I'm definitely guilty of saying, hey, honey, <laughs> this is going so well right now. <laughs> That's usually you, yeah, right at the top <laughs> when yeah. the bell rings. <laughs> uh, uh, it's great. So one other point, I know we're, we're getting close to the end of the hour, and I want to make sure that that, that uh, I honor your time. Today, Brendan, but uh, there's another co- uh, concept that I, I definitely want to unpack, and that's around, you know, how you talk about how traders often um, tend to act like the crowd, um, and then yeah. we find ourselves um, having that crowd mentality. Right, and so that is in, you know, Chapter 8, and it's, it's the emotional, and the, 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 the quintessential example of emotional decision-making is the crowd, and yes. I went back to... LeBond's The Crowd from 1905, which is, you know, I'm sure it's, it, you know, in the, in, the, in the traders' libraries, you know, or advertised and promoted. It's a very interesting book, and I, and I bring out some of the examples used in there to identify what are the traits of a crowd. But the, 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 the sort of Reader's Digest version of it for me to kind of, you know, pop in here right now is that I believe that um, if you exhibit, you can exhibit those traits of affirmation, repetition, prestige, and contagion, like, oh, this trade is really working. Yeah, yeah, it is. I mean, you're in an echo chamber. If you call your best friend and say, hey, what do you think of this? Yeah, I think that's looking good. You can talk yourself into, you, you can just do it as, as self-talk. You can, in the isolation of your own trading room or your den, if you're trading over a computer, you don't have to be around a whole bunch of other people to behave like a crowd does and get that sense of, of invincibility. You can do it if you exhibit those traits. You can do it in the privacy of your own home as an isolated individual. And right. the crowd is emotional decision making. It is what causes people to, you know, they win a national championship and they burn police cars. It's because they have protection. They, 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 things that they would never do on their own, they will do under the cover of other people being there with them. I think that in the markets, you can find yourself making what I call a crowd trade, is that you right. are held in a rapt state of attention. You may have just lost some money. You're looking for the next best opportunity. A tip comes along, you hear this, and bang, you're off the chair and going and doing it. But it's, it's outside the parameters of the trade plan. It's outside the parameters of whatever your, you know, your system, your methodology is. And what it does is... If you marry, if you and I put this in the book, if you marry those kinds of crowd behaviors with our natural response to the uncertainty of the future, which is hope and fear, mm-hmm. you can create personal manias and panics. A mania grabs a whole group of people and makes them go nuts, right? It can be in the market. It can be, um, it can be setting police cars on fire after a championship. Whatever. It's, it's manic. It's mania. Okay. That's hope plus crowd behavior, right? And then yep. fear plus crowd behavior is a panic. So I think that you can sit in the privacy of your own room, and you can match crowd behavior with hope, and have a personal mania, and you can marry crowd behavior with fear and have a personal panic. Ain't nobody sitting in the room with you at all. You're there by yourself doing this. And that, again, it, 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 that, that's another way that these three kind of feed on each other. They're not yeah. compartmentalized. It's a, it's a dangerous cocktail. And that turns into the crowd trade. Yeah. You basically inserted, yeah, yourself that, into a crowd trade. Or you that's what I, used, when I used to critique my own you know, trades afterwards. When I was, when I was, yeah. It wasn't like I sat down to develop the theory. I was trying to figure out what was going on. And I, in the course mm-hmm. of doing it, this is, this is you know, this is the late 80s, early 90s when I'm doing this. I'm like, this seems to be what I'm doing. And then I, I just started categorizing them. And then that's when I came up with the three mistakes. And then later I found the definition. And I'm like, okay, well, that works. It all goes together. So, I, yeah, yeah, I called them crowd trades. I mean, it's, that's what I was doing. And it's so powerful because it resonates across all time frames, whether you're, you know, uh, a market oh, yeah. maker type who's, you know, at the lowest time frame to, you know, an investor who's trading years at a time. It just resonates yeah, across all yeah. those time frames. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, so powerful. So maybe just a couple of quick fire questions and then um, 
and then I'll, I'll let you share where people can find out more about your work. But I've heard you say in other interviews, and I, I just want to unpack this one because I thought it was curious. Uh, you said that, I don't know if you said good traders or, or successful people have a, a healthy disrespect for money. I love I that oh, yeah. when I heard that. <laughs> yeah. What do you mean by that? No, that's, well, I don't know where, I mean, I don't know how I, you know, came to that or whatever, but, you know, yeah. I found that, you know, that, that, well, it's back to that whole self-worth net worth thing, right? It's like, mm. for me, it's, you know, it, it, for me, money solves problems, okay? And um, it's not, you know, flash or trying to make people think that you're better than them or, you know, whatever. Um, look, everybody, there's only one person in the world at any given time where no one has more money than that person. Everybody, everybody you meet is going to have either more or less money. You know what I mean? So it's like, why get all wrapped up and caught up in that? It's really just not that big a deal. I mean, if it is to you and you're using the markets as a way to, to express that, I think that it's, I think it's dangerous. Some of the best traders I know do have a healthy disrespect for it. They're not flashy. They don't necessarily have a flashy car or flashy clothes or whatever. It's, just a, it's, it's what they do, right? Uh, one of the best bond traders in the 1980s in the bond pit in Chicago, he did not count money during the day. He counted ticks. It was almost like a game. Mm -hmm. Oh, I have 13 yeah. ticks. Oh, I got 72 ticks. Now, it was a number, but it wasn't a dollar sign in front of it, right? It's not, yeah. it's not what he was about. Um, yeah. So that's been, yeah, I mean, that's, you know, I've been doing this for, I don't know, 26, 27 years. So, yeah, that's my observation is that some of the best ones just money is not what it's about. Yeah. And that's a powerful piece of advice. And, uh, and what I've seen and what I know is that uh, the opposite is true as well. It's, it's, you know, any trader who comes in the game with scarcity they won't be successful because that mindset will just bring you more scarcity. Right. So, so we'll just end up end the, end the call this way. I, I just want to tell, tell everyone again that again, pick up Brendan's book. It's a great book. It's been out for a long time, but if you haven't read it, it's a great title. And as we said before, you know, and I've heard you talk about this uh, at the same time is that I think this is a great book to pair with some of those other books, so the books about how to make money. So if you already have some of those books about how to make thousands and millions of dollars and that's great. But this book takes it from the other angle, right? So you're inverting that and, and approaching it from, the, from how, it, how it is to, to lose money. So, so thank you, Brendan, for, the, for your time today. Where can people find out more about you or your work if they want to, uh, to, uh, to find out some more? Um, well, I don't know. I mean, it's, I mean the, the books are a hobby. Um, it's, like I say, it's not really what I do for a living. Um, I've written a couple of them. Um, I guess you I don't have like a website or anything, but you could like Google my name to find the books or articles I've written or stuff like that. But like I say, it's just a hobby. It's not. It's, 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 it's not my, my main thing. So. Yeah, I know Brennan has a, a good page on Amazon that shows uh, the rest of his titles. So, so I would direct people there in case they want to to see some of uh, your other books as well. All right. So thank you so much, Brennan. It was a lot of fun today. I hope we get a chance to do it again. Great. I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah. Likewise. Thank you. Bye. All right, bye-bye. Have a great day. Bye now. been listening to the Trading Edges podcast. We've taken this interview and summarized all the big ideas so that you can take action. Just head over to the tradingedge.org slash podcast to find the show notes, transcript, resources, and to continue the conversation.